silence, followed by a short, famous prayer from Thich Nhat Hanh, Let Us Be Silent. I have arrived. I am home. In the here and in the now. I am solid. I am free. In the ultimate, I dwell. So good afternoon. As the program explains, I'm Catherine, and this is the rather unorthodox, though heartfelt, invocation. Claude was a friend to me as well as a teacher. I've actually known Claude since I was a very young child, and though those days are rather long past, I can recall as though it was yesterday, the excitement and the exotic nature of a trip to Claude's house in Pollock with my family back in the old days. The beautiful white house, a palace to my sisters and me, atop a rolling green hill, the spare, serene interior with its polished hardwood floors, the odd-looking but strangely delicious Japanese food Claude would serve on interesting plates and platters, then sometimes sitting and eating that food altogether with chopsticks on the floor. Claude's yellow, muscular dog, Yoshitsune, the way he'd call out its name, the woods and fields behind Claude's house where once we picnicked, Claude tilting back in his chair and squinting up his eyes, laughing in response to my father's teasing, shaking his head with mirth. Claude was a part of my childhood, and I still carry with me strong, warm, fun memories of him from way back. Claude is seen and experienced through a child's eyes, a child's heart. Then later, though I couldn't have predicted that this would be so, Claude became my teacher and thesis advisor at Bennington College. And so I came to know him also through the eyes of a young adult and student. And so I also carry strong memories of Claude through that me. And reflecting back on those days, what I remember most strongly now is his love. I don't think I thought of it as love at the time, not consciously. Claude was an old family friend and was suddenly a teacher and academic advisor. He was someone familiar, someone I knew. But I understand now how loved I felt by him and how much I did love him also, in turn. A few weeks ago, Mark sent me an excerpt from Donna Tartt's excellent book, A Secret History, about the character Julian opening the door to his office, exactly as he had the first time, she writes by opening it only a crack and looking through it warily, as if there was something wonderful in his office that needed guarding, something that he was careful not everyone should see. When I reread this passage, many memories of Claude at Bennington College reemerged from wherever it was I'd been storing them in my mind. Yes, yes, I too remember Claude opening his office door so much the way Donna Tarp describes. I remember too his glee at seeing me. It seemed like glee. The excitement he seemed to feel that I had arrived for our meeting. I felt special and wanted. And whatever I'd been feeling when I'd arrived in the narrow hallway with my books and sheets of poems, I would feel always happy to see Claude, happy to be invited through the door into his sun-strewn office. I remember him offering me tea or something good to eat, and how we would eventually catch up and gossip, share pet peeves and passions, and eventually discuss my poems. Sometimes we would become frustrated with one another. I remember Claude becoming a bit blustery on a number of occasions when I didn't agree with his edits. I'm sure I was quite stubborn. But I never felt afraid or unloved by Claude, even when we disagreed. I felt safe, and I was, despite my lack of edits, loved always for who I was, accepted and embraced, no matter how my poems read out in the end. So I don't know how all of you know or knew Claude Fredericks, but I'm guessing that most of you would agree that Claude's presence created a presence. A welcoming, warm, engaging, engaged, confiding, interested, interesting, laughter-filled, attentive presence. I bet that you too remember the atmosphere created by Claude. He sort of conjured it, a brimming joyfulness, a conversational merriment, a special attentiveness to life and you. I enjoyed his company so much and felt always without questioning the feeling, secure that he enjoyed mine. I appreciate that so much now. I'm sure many, many of you felt the same. To the eyes of an older and hopefully wiser me, I realize now how nurturing Claude was. 
So I was asked by Mark to do the invocation for this service. Invocations really should never be this long. But in the way of invocation, I would like to invite his presence now, Claude's presence, along with also the presence of the great mystery, the great beyond, the spirit, the infinite present, where Claude now resides in, I am sure, glittering form. Perhaps if you don't mind, let's picture him opening the door now, the door to his office, the door to where he is and what he knows, to who he was and is for us, his love, his eyes sparkling with delight that we have come. He invites us in to the next wonderful step of our lives and his, to the new relationship we will now have with his spirit, now that he's moved on beyond this earthly plane to something I can only imagine is quite stunningly excellent and exciting. Thank you so much, Claude, for opening the door and letting us in. May your spirit and the spirit be with us this day as we gather to celebrate and remember you. you, it seemed he could contain all of you, 
It was a complete awareness, a consciousness of you. And he had this amazing gift of seemingly extracting from you all of your thoughts, your innermost secrets, your fears, your loves, your history, and your entire life story, which he would then write down in his journal. <laughs> it, it was never a prying or a nosiness, but always a sincere, open-hearted curiosity, a genuine interest that he would take in you. Everyone who knew Claude speaks about this amazing quality he had, this genuine inquisitiveness. And I often told Claude that what I loved most about, about him was his extraordinary courtesy. He was the most polite human being I've ever met, and this was, I think, always true. He was polite and courteous to all others, even all sentient beings, animals, chipmunks, <laughs> frogs, the frog pond, insects in the house that he wouldn't swat with a swat, I mean, he was a good Buddhist that he was. But most of all, Club was polite to me. When I met him at 19, and when I came to live with him at 25, and the succeeding 18 years, and every single day of our life together, this continued to be true. In planning our life together, he seemed to see to my wishes always. He always wanted to do whatever I wanted to do. And yet he was my guide those formative years at Bennington, and especially after I left college. He helped me find my way, my own identity as an adult. He was always, always so gently, gently, courteously, politely, kindly showing me the way. And very few people know actually that Claude and I were actually married. Um, it was March 20th, 2010. It was the vernal equinox um, there at the Middlebury Inn in Middlebury, just the two of us with the Justice of the Peace that we'd found in the phone book. We'd arranged, um, we drove on then to Montreal and had dinner and uh, spent the evening in a lovely auberge there in the Vieux-Port, a beautiful place we'd love to stay. You know, getting married was something that, I think it was something our lawyers and perhaps one or two other people advised, thinking that this was wise. It was nothing we otherwise would have done, I think, because we already considered ourselves married, um, going back to when I first came to be with him in 1995. And we even wore our rings, which I have one on, the beautiful, simple silver bands that we found in Paris in 1998. We hardly needed any official recognition of the fact of marriage, eat by family or friends, much less any government body. As, so as companions, Claude and I were unlike many others. Uh, when I walked in Claude's office door at Bennington, I was signing up for Homer, his class in Homer, at the fall uh, uh, 1989, so this would have been in the spring, the previous spring. I was 19, Claude was by then already 67 years old, a very charming 67. There was a 47 year age difference between us. And yet over all these years, this somehow never seemed to matter. Our hearts were ageless. Claude was my guide, my teacher, but he was also my lover and my best friend, the other half, as he often said, of me, of my very self, as I was to him. And giving myself to Claude as I did, completely, I feared sometimes that I'd be giving up a part of me, somehow compromising myself, losing myself. Instead, and I've said this to several of you um, these months, instead of losing my identity in Claude's seemingly overwhelming identity, I found myself, I discovered my own beautiful identity, which turned out to be quite different from his, though we shared a great many similar traits. And I realized my full self. So in giving my entire self to God in return, and through his gentle guidance, his enormous love for me, I became the man I'd all my life dreamt of being, and every dream I'd ever had, even as a little boy, came true. This was Claude's greatest gift to me. So. I'm going to say a few words later, but, um, so, Peter, are you? <coughs> We're going to play for you uh, a couple of songs that I wrote recently based on text that Claude wrote, but before that, Mark graciously invited me to say a few words. I feel very humbled to stand before you to celebrate the life of Claude Fredericks, a man who was one of a handful of people who had a tremendous impact on me. He was my teacher and my friend. I first met Claude almost 40 years ago when I was a freshman at Bennington. There were rumors 
There was this reclusive eccentric who lived on top of a mountain and received a dollar a day for teaching at the college. Not true, any of it, except the mountain. Um, it was an explosive time, the early 70s, the end of the 60s, and all that went with that. And I kept hearing about something called the Frederick's Plan, which was a utopian vision of a student-run college with virtually no administration. At the time, being very young and idealistic myself, I was drawn to this idea, and I went to meet Mr. Frederick's. The plan, unsurprisingly, never got traction, but it did lead to my study in Greek with Claude for two years, reading long sections of the Odyssey and Iliad, and through Claude soaking up the essence of the Greeks. He was somehow able to impart a living and breathing understanding of how the Greeks saw the world. He was also the first person that I had encountered who wasn't a musician but had a deep spiritual and intellectual connection to music. We listened to a large number of Bach cantatas together discussing their qualities and differences. Our friendship grew during my years at Bennington, continued when I came back to teach there, and through the period when both of us were, shall we say, separated from the college. I came to disagree with him about a great many things, late romantic music, for example, which he disliked, um, politics, mind changed, but his powerfully strong vision helped me clarify my own views. Claude was truly an esthete. The dictionary defines an esthete as, quote, one who cultivates an unusually high sensitivity to beauty, as in art and nature. That is Claude. An unusually high sensitivity to beauty, as in art or nature. He created himself and his life as an act of beauty. His mission was to make all the details of his life beautiful. On a mundane note, I can never forget his downstairs bathroom, the delicate stemware wine glass with the few necessary grooming implements neatly lined up next to it, the toilet facing not into the room but looking out into his garden as if to say every moment, even the act of defecation, should involve a contemplation of the beautiful. The meals were a feast, the presentation beyond anything I had ever seen. He took the trouble to stamp the butter with an image of Peter Stoifelpater. Who can forget the Sarah Bernhardt peonies? His attention to make beautiful the details of life was astonishing. As quoted to me recently by mutual friend Roger Sorkin, who has near total recall of all things culinary, describing a dessert. Here's Roger. Claude took a compote of white milk glass, went out to the garden, and came back with young grape leaves, which he draped over the edge of the top, squeezed fresh oranges to flood the base of the dish, and then floated strawberries in the fresh squeezed juice. Presentation was important, was as important as taste. Maybe they are the same. I remember Claude taking me down to the basement to show me the fortress-like, secure safe that housed over 50 years of his life's work, his journal. As he opened the door to the safe, a photo fell to the floor. Claude picked it up, and then noticed it was a photo of his mother. He said with that quintessentially almost muffled but maniacal laughter, the true author of my work. <laughs> Claude wrote in his journal almost every day since age six. I remember the first line as being, I got a pony for Christmas. <laughs> he once admitted to me that he was sometimes afraid to have too active a social life because he wouldn't have time to keep up with all the details in his journal. I remember his bringing his friend Anais Nin to Bennington to give the commencement address one year, and I found myself surrounded at a party afterwards by a group of assiduous student diarists pounding the two of them with all sorts of questions about diary writing. I certainly felt like a visitor to a strange land. Claude was a person of many fascinating contradictions. A Buddhist who cooked a mean roast beef, a man of solitude and a man of the world. He was gentle, he was fierce. I understood that Claude could be a rather cantankerous colleague. And I remember early on before I knew him, going to a reading he gave from his journal, 
who have been publicly and pointedly, and not so flatteringly, referred to, referred to three of his literature division colleagues as the self-appointed Joseph, Mary, and baby Jesus. He was capable of fierce and loyal friendships. I recall his particular closeness to Nick Del Banco and Bernard Malamud. Sometimes Claude seemed to me, when I looked at him, like he came from another time. Greek, Roman, medieval, Renaissance. It certainly wasn't the 19th century. But he had a Zalig-like ability to take on the essence of whatever period he was teaching or discussing. Now I realize the subject I'm about to discuss is not necessarily or necessarily typically typical or even appropriate for an occasion such as this, but here I go as a tribute to Claude's fierceness and his quest for truth and honesty. That has to do with the unfortunate and bizarre circumstances of his leaving Bennington. His final showdown with the administration, the witch hunt-like proceedings that led to his early retirement were part trial of Socrates, part trial of Oscar Wilde, and more than a little bit, part Lillian Hellman's Children's Hour. I served as his faculty representative in lieu of an attorney. At the height of our nation's craze to weed out the evils of sexual harassment, Claude was accused by a student, a student who was encouraged by the administration. In fact, the student was coached by the director of missions to bring a secret tape recorder to a dinner engagement to get Claude's unwanted advances on tape. Of course, anyone who knew Claude and knew the boy had no doubt that this was just not a candidate for his romantic interest. And of course, there was nothing on the tape other than polite conversation and the clattering of knives and forks. Yet this invented interaction led to the ignoble circumstances Claude found himself in and his decision to retire. It's particularly shocking that the college, claiming recently that he had been fired, he actually resigned, refused to publish his obituary in the alumni magazine. Especially cruel to, to me, as he had so many devoted and beloved students over the years. I myself was fired, and though I personally look at this in hindsight as a blessing, except for the separation from my many friends, it was not a blessing for Claude, certainly not in the way it came about. And so, as with many of his colleagues who were fired when I was, this was an ugly and unwanted, unwarranted chapter in their lives and the life of the school. Even the late, great Christopher, Christopher Hitchens, writing for a London newspaper, wrote a piece called Their Hounding Geniuses in Vermont. So in continuing defense of my old friend, I mention it here. I still bristle at the indignities he endured during those painful months. Typical of Claude, after the whole thing was over, he made a gift to me of the complete orchestral scores of both of Alpenberg's operas, Wozzeck and Lulu, an expensive and extravagant gesture that, along with, the, along with the poignant transcription he wrote on the inside cover, I will always treasure. My family had the privilege of visiting several times with Claude and Mark in more, year, in more recent years when they both came to Los Angeles to visit his journal at the Getty Museum. More than anything, I think of the generations of students whom he taught, the lives that were changed, for example, by taking his full year course on Dante. I will always treasure knowing Claude. He taught me many things about friendship, love, the Greeks, poetry, food, music, nature, and yes, about beauty. He lived his life as a work of art. He is a constant inspiration. And now Kimball Wheeler, who is also a great friend of Claude, uh, and I will perform three songs that I recently wrote based on poems.
hear me without the microphone? I met Claude Fredericks through James Merrill, so I'll begin there, when Claude met Jimmy. It was 1950. Claude was 26, Jimmy 24. They fell in love at a party in New York, a party for publication of Fred Beekner's first novel. Uh, they fell in love uh, rapturously and ecstatically, and immediately made plans to travel together to Europe. The destination and duration of this journey unspecified. They both wanted to get out of Cold War America. They both wanted to see Europe. They both wanted to write. They wanted to be able to love each other without being despised, pathologized, or arrested, all of which were real possibilities. As Claude told me once, it felt daring to take Jimmy's arm in Times Square. And it was daring to set off to Europe together. Anyone who has read James Merrill's memoir, A Different Person, knows at least Jimmy's side of what happened next. They motored around, moving from hotel to hotel, fresco to fresco. And they spent a dreary winter on Mallorca, where Fred visited them. They made friends with Alice B. Toklas. They settled in Rome, all the time making each other and themselves miserable. They weren't meant to be lovers, which they found out soon enough. When Merrill was getting ready to return to the U.S. from Rome in 1952, he wrote to Fredericks, who was already back in Vermont, Detry, Merrill is writing, and he means Dr. Thomas Detry, the psychiatrist they shared. Detry remarked the other day that lovers don't become friends, that they exhaust one another. And probably that's true enough. I think, though, in our own case, that we were somehow, happily as it now appears, spared that experience. I mean, I don't think we exhausted each other. We only exhausted ourselves. I, myself, you, yourself, in the effort to live up to what we were dreaming of. Which might even be to say that the years were more beautiful than we knew. These former lovers became lifelong friends. Merrill was a water bug, as he called himself sometimes, flitting across the surface of things, always in motion while Frederick spent his days in Pollock, upright as his farmhouse, as steady in his habits as his great white pine, Zeus, the subject of that poem that we just heard Peter setting of, tree shading his house. Claude's meditative way of life represented to Jimmy an ideal. The unpretentious plainness of the house was attractive to Merrill, who lived among the below and souvenirs, ornaments, and playthings. But Claude wasn't an ascetic. No, his sumptuous meals, his tiny martinis, the crackle of the fireplace, the sunlight pouring through windows without curtains, lighting up the Norfolk Island pine in the living room. A visit to Paul was a deeply sensuous experience. Merrill kept looking for it. He visited every year in the spring or summer, sometimes in the fall. When he had finished his long Ouija board poem, he brought the transcripts from his talks with the spirits to burn in Claude's fireplace. In August, just a few months away from his death, Jimmy made his last visit to Claude. Over the long haul, they had achieved a wry intimacy superior to the famished devotion that they began with. Jimmy wrote to his host afterwards, you give yourself so easily, so fully. Perhaps that's what being a Buddhist means. But I suspect it's really just being you. Anyhow, we lapped it up like cream, or 
creme bavaroise. <laughs> that is the delectable dessert that was a specialty of Claude's and later Claude's and Marks. Following in James Merrill's steps as his biographer, I met Claude and Mark 12 years ago. We became friends. I was served at Creme Barbaroise, charmed and seduced, relaxed and invigorated by my stay in Paula. I understood, I think, why Merrill was drawn <coughs> to Frederick's in 1950 and why he kept returning to Claude's side for the next 40 years. Jimmy could see very early on what would be clearly manifest so much later, that Claude was an American original. He had the capacity for self-creation. It's what we see in Thoreau, Henry Adams, Gertrude Stein. Like Merrill, he was the child of a broken home. With his mother, Vera, whose photo came fluttering out of the safe when Peter saw it, with his mother Vera sponsoring his precocious interests, he grew up in Springfield, Missouri, making home movies, reading Freud and Proust on loan from faraway centers of learning like Kansas City, <laughs> listening to radio broadcasts from the Metropolitan Opera on Saturday afternoons, and writing a diary. He went on to write poems and plays. He became a distinguished printer an influential teacher. But the diary was his primary work. He took it with him to Harvard, where he was too much of an autodidact to last very long. He took it with him to New York, where he fell, uh, fell in with, with celebrity bohemians like Carl Van Vechten, and learned the craft of printing. And he took it here to Vermont. There are few places as idyllic as Paula. Driving there from Manchester, you feel as though you're going back in time. The small river, first on one side, then on the other side of the road, runs through an earlier America. Surely it felt that way in the 1940s, too. New York. Claude saw it as a likely target for the next atom bomb not implausibly. And in that context, the mountains of Pollock felt, as they still feel, profoundly safe. Remember, too, that this was the era of the closet. Claude, who was always forthright with himself and others, understood as if instinctively that this was a place where he could live a gay life without hiding. And there he wrote his diary. Is there another journal like it? typed, for the most part, with minimal corrections, day after day, for eight decades. The diary documents Claude's remarkable persistence, his power of insistence, his strange dedication to recording, examining, reflecting on everything that happened to him, everything he thought and felt, experience and the registration of it, race, neck and neck, uh, in this endless book, the one always only barely out in front of the other. Claude never wanted to revise what he wrote. That was an expression of his perfect honesty, and his wish to be simply who he was. But I think he also felt he never had time. How could he keep up with life except to go on? How much would he risk losing where he could stop and start revising? He kept the diary in the basement, <clears throat> in that great black safe that uh, Peter described. And there's that word again, safe. Now, although it might take us a lifetime to do it, we have the diary to read in the archive at the Getty Research Center and in the handsome volumes, noble in their plain dark blue covers that Claude and Mark have published. My wife, Uta, who visited Claude and Mark with me a few years ago, reminds me, can it really be true, that the license plate on Claude's car reads ELF. That's right. <laughs> E-L-F. I see him now with his bright eyes and elfin smile. 
He was smiling and having had his way with life, having created the singular world in which he lived, and most important, having found Mark, who was the incarnation of the partner he'd always sought, beginning with his first expressions of boyhood desire in the diary. Mark joined him in the last long chapter of that life of self-creation, and I think it was the deepest satisfaction for them both.
what I wanted to do now is talk about um, Claude, the man, um, through his words, and I thought I might write, read from his, his journal. Um, I've chosen three entries from the last year of his life, 2012. They'll give you a sense of Claude's writing, his consciousness, his awareness of the world around him, his deep feeling, his love for life, and his love for me. There are glimpses of our daily life there at the house in Holland, descriptions of nature, meditations on music, literature, reflections on his own writing, embarrassing praise everywhere of me. But, but finally there begins to be a realization of his sickness. Um, there's, in the pages, his struggle with these essential big questions as he faced death. And that there continued to be, through all this, these difficult last months after his diagnosis and through the terrible and painful treatments, as he called them, um, and deep pain, a youthful hope, a boyish joy, and love always in his heart. Claude was very, very happy these years. He was, till the very end, thankful, joyful, and in love. No one's ever read these pages that I'm going to read to you. Um, even I've not read these until these recent days of preparing for today. In part because I felt it, was, it would be too difficult for me to do. I should say too that, um, except that in fact, except for in a very few instances, I'm the only one who's read most of the journal um, and passed the published volumes in 1944. Uh, I, don't, I don't think anyone's read any of those journals. Um, so I'm going to begin with January 11th. This was going back now to 2012, and this, of course, is this is this is Claude. This, I had just photocopied it in his blue ribbon um, using his Olivetti typewriter. <laughs> okay, so I'll try again. It's now Wednesday, the 11th of the first month of the new year at 12:45 midday. Even if only for 45 minutes, when we're stopping work to have lunch and go off to town for the week's shopping, even if it's a day earlier than usual, than the usual Thursday. That's because a big snowstorm with snow and ice both is predicted for tonight, sometime after the witching hour, and for tomorrow too, and Wednesday as well. I finally invited Tom Fells to talk about the piece he may write about our work here, about my work as a printer, a teacher, a playwright about the long journal I've written for the past 80 years and this very page. These very words are instant evidence at this very moment and in fact writing. For lunch on Friday, and my sweet friend and I were deciding on the menu this very morning, a gumbo filet followed by a salad of finely sliced Pinocchio, and then my favorite for many years, even if rarely made by me anymore, an almond cream pie, I sometimes call a frangipani pie. But the storm promises to continue with snow and ice and sleet into Friday, and we'll see how things go. Not at all sure that Claude Dern will, there has not been any need even once before now, come, as usual, to plow our road. The price we pay to keep the big town trucks now from making our narrow little road, our driveway in fact, a road that leads nowhere but to this house, from becoming the highway the town officials would, it seems, like to make it become. The mercury at my back here in the press room says it's 32 degrees outside. My little brown clock here on my desk says it's already 117. The milk house heater at my feet, they're now made in China, but we still have two, even if the first, made in Canada, I think, is in the shop of Ease Electric in Manchester. <laughs> a story worth telling, perhaps sometime, if not now, is purring agreeably. It will be time for me to stop in a minute or two or at least in ten. How ineffably pleasant it is to be sitting here tapping at my little letter of 31 typewriter, an exact replica of the Dora I had before, if this one, made in Spain, in Barcelona in fact, and not as the other was, I think, in Italy. <laughs> the ink and the ribbon is a little faded. I need to order a new one, but still legible. I'll hear my sweet friend's voice in a moment or two, his steps on the stair, his sweet bonjour, and then we'll stop to fix lunch with him and go off to town to do the week's shopping. Because of the predicted storms, the stores may be crowded this afternoon, but we will, I trust, manage. Ah, uh, how strangely and radiantly happy I feel for no reason. Or, in reality, for every reason. Perhaps because I'm again restored to myself here after this month and ten days of silence. 
writing whatever it is I feel like writing. I look at the clock, it says 1.30 as I look at it, or perhaps 1.31, and everything everywhere seems a joyous feeling to be exactly how it should be, how it must be, how it is. May the Lord, whoever he in fact is, bless all that is, and fill it with the love that fills my heart. So that's, that's this January. Now I'm going to jump to, this is now July 28th. Um, Claude has had a diagnosis, and he, we both know now that he's sick. And uh, so, Saturday, yes, the 28th. Two days before the anniversary, my sweet and adored friend and I are celebrating on Monday, yes, the 30th, a day marking the fact that it's now 18 years since my sweet friend came to live with me here in Pollock, making all that went before nothing. In fact, that the two of us hardly ever separated night or day since then, for more than a few hours at most all these years, our life together continually growing richer and still richer as each year passed. I began reading to him aloud that first summer. He was always beside me, following with his eye the words I was reading. A number of my stories, the wedding, the long novel too, notebooks, a vast number of poems, several of my plays. And soon I was beginning, every morning after breakfast, upstairs in bed still, for almost an hour at a time, this journal from its very first pages, the ones written in a little five-year diary, and continuing wherever we were, traveling, living here, on jaunts of one kind or another, for six or seven years, I think, it's, it's actually more than like nine or ten, all 50 or 60,000 pages, up to the time that he came here to be with me, yes, forever, in 1995. Each year he seemed even more in love with me than the year before, undaunted by all that he was learning about every aspect of my life, of my desires and fulfillment, of people I'd known and things I'd done, places I'd been, hardships I'd suffered, fears I had endured, had anyone ever before given the one he loved such a gift, a gift that could easily become a burden, but in fact only made richer and deeper all the love that my sweet Marco felt for me? Loyally believing right whatever it was I was saying or doing or thinking or having, remembering it all in a miraculous way afterwards too. Memory himself, I teased him by saying one day, when I told him the idea I had for a little play, where this journal itself was the main character and how he, remembering everything with such clarity and accuracy and love, was indeed that character for someone in some ways like him, in every way like him in all truth, knowing more about me because of reading all these, those thousands of pages, because of all the books I, in fact, published or not, had written, because of every day for all these 18 years, endlessly talking about everything together, listening to me too, reading and talking about all the books I've loved more, most over the years, the Iliad, of course, and the Odyssey, the Aeneid, the Commedia, I reading it in Italian as he looked at the en face translation besides the, beside the Italian, three times, in fact, and, and just now, there he was himself a few minutes early, coming downstairs to take in the chairs from their places on the back terrace out of the rain that had begun, and saying he would be back in just a few minutes. I was still caught up by all I was beginning to recite of all that my sweet friend and I had over all these years done together and accomplished. From the Steinauer prospectus we did until we began to make plans to publish the whole of the journal in its entirety with the publisher we found that suited our own purposes entirely and gave into our hands the final decisions about every aspect of typography and publication. And by 2003, volume one was indeed an actual fact. Pause. It's, it's later now, a heavy rainfall had begun before I finished the paragraph above, and Marco had come anyhow, ready to make lunch with me, and I stopped. While we were making lunch, the rain came down so hard that I thought I'd never seen rain come down so hard, even in knowing that, of course, I more than once probably had. It took a little while to make the Catalini and Brodo we decided to make with the excellent broth from the stock we'd made, the night, uh, we'd made from parts of the chicken we were cooking the night before. But it was delicious, we both thought. And the ensalada, a chiffonade of iceberg lettuce, sliced thin with a few slices of raw onion was too. For a little while then, I made corrections, few were necessary, of, all, of the all but perfect newsletter for the foundation, number four of the series Mark has been working on. And we had hot chocolate then that Marco had made 
before we parted, and when about the late afternoon passed, Marco did deal with the last problems the newsletter posed and the corrections I had suggested before he began to sweep two or three of the rooms downstairs, including this long neglected press room. Can I now pick up again where I left off, where I was, thinking of the anniversary coming day after tomorrow, reciting to myself all the infinite number of things that my sweet and only friend and I have these almost 20 years done together and accomplished, how much he's grown, how his virtues, as the years pass, have become always more manifest, how happy we've been, happy in a way I didn't know two people, no matter how they loved each other, could be. The past 10 years, Marco has gained a sense of purpose in his life, has seen himself clearly as responsible for seeing the journal, volume after volume, published, has seen how the house here must in time become a museum and library, has grasped so well every aspect of my wishes and all things, and all this, his now too, and learn all the reasons why each thing I believe is so. His admiration for me, as mine for him, has only steadily grown month after month, year after year. Our love for each other, our solicitude for each other's well-being at every turn. No one else matters to us except the other, our own self too. No other joy is there except the joy we share together, the books we read together, the music we listen to. All the great works, or many, that man has made in the last two or three millennia. The concerts we go to, the museums we go to, the trips we take, the daily pattern of our daily lives together, the everything and all that we want, of course, to last forever and ever and ever, and somehow believe will. But on the 16th of this month, less than two weeks ago, the long postponed trip to a doctor, there was none to be had, was made, and the steady series of meetings and tests the next few days seemed to make it seem to make it seem possible that I am more seriously sick than any symptoms I have been struggling with the past month or two suggest. That's all I can say now. My sweet friend and I too keep brave and happy, keep our thoughts free from imaginings of one kind or another. Uh, there's his sweet voice from the shower. The evening is beginning. I'll go take him his towel. So that's June. And that, that's July. So now we're in November. And this one's brief. Saturday the 10th of November at almost 1.30, for perhaps an hour or so, at my machine, at my Olivetti, my letter of 31, here in the press room, with the sun overhead shining warm and bright, with the mercury at my back registering a self-confident 50 degrees outside, in my Turkish robe, still, the way I am till lunchtime the past few weeks, with its beautiful yukata underneath. Ready to say, ah, uh, what, really? I'm not quite sure. Years ago, when I was living in my big room on East 65th Street, I would, after a small breakfast, settle down to writing about the previous day from start to finish, or try to, even if the resolution to keep a certain pattern did not really succeed for very long, even then, or for that matter, later. How difficult, surely, as apparent in these very sentences, it is to extract even from these sentences from my stubborn lips, from my stubborn fingers. Ah, with small interruptions of one kind or another this morning, mostly ones I myself have caused. It's already a quarter after two, and will soon be time to stop. Should I not simply wad up this sheet and throw it away and call it all a day? No. I must keep that honesty for whatever it's worth that has been the character of this journal all its 82 years. Shall I blame it all on the pills I take now every few hours that seem to affect my memory, the character of my understanding, my energy in adverse and troubling ways? Perhaps, at least in part, but not by any means entirely and altogether. It's not by any means clear from anything my several doctors, but most of all Dr. Ives, am willing to say just how sick I am and how, I, how entirely I should be anticipating an entire, or perhaps only a partial cure, if any cure at all. When we saw Dr. Ives on Wednesday, she was particularly warm and in every way encouraging, and my sweet friend and I both came away happy and relieved. The nurse who drew the blood, the nurse, Maria, who is Dr. Ives' constant assistant and accomplice, both of them were particularly warm and helpful and reassuring. I must do what I'm told to do, Keep faith that all will be well. What else? 
It's 2.30 at this very moment and time to stop. I'll go get dressed and begin to make lunch. My sweet Marco and I will have. It's time to, I'm ready to. And so, I'm gonna read one more briefly in a minute, but I just wanted to say a few words first. Um, so, um, Claude's death in January was for me and for many of us a kind of death too. The incredible loss of our companion, our friend, our teacher has been devastating. But Claude has left me, has left behind to all of us a great deal indeed. And these months I've come to realize that I have an intense desire to honor him in every way that I possibly can during the course of my own lifetime, one that I can only hope will be as long and as beautiful as his. In continuing to publish the journal, his plays, poems, notebooks, letters, and in seeking to preserve his house and land for the common good and for future generations. A pa as passionate and as prolific as he was as a writer, as an artist, I would say too that as a thinker, a big thinker, and I sometimes think visionary thinker, he was deeply concerned about the big ideas and devoted his life to making connections for himself and for others, mostly his students, across many disparate disciplines. As a philosopher, as a classicist, he had a great knowledge of and love for the ancient texts, as well as for the greatest, the greatest artistic achievements of man, East and West. As a Buddhist, he pondered the nature of human suffering in the world and sought ways through the example of his own thought and action in which to alleviate this suffering. As many of you know, Claude was entirely self-taught and he was the ultimate lifelong learner. He worked very hard as a teacher, was absolutely devoted to his students, to their learning, to imparting his love of literature, of knowledge, of culture, of spiritual insight to them. And I often told Claude that I felt his greatest gift was as a teacher. This legacy of Claude as teacher is a legacy that I think all of us, and many of you here today are his former students, care a great deal about nurturing into the future. Claude's house in Paulette was, throughout the 65 years that he lived there, his unique retreat from the world, a sanctuary of stillness, order, that reflected his own refined aesthetic. He believed profoundly that such an environment, such a retreat, was of, was of essential importance in pursuing with concentration and creativity his life work. With life work, amazingly enough, the writing of the longest journal in the history of American literature, perhaps even in the English language or any language, a social document without parallel, an unprecedented literary achievement, a masterpiece of self-reflection. To honor Claude and to carry forward his legacy, I'm working with many people here, and you know who you are, and others to open the doors of Claude's house, our house, with purpose, with courtesy, with an appreciation of quality, to convert the house into not only a library and research center devoted to Claude and preserving his manuscripts, his belongings, his way of life, but also as a retreat center for talented writers, artists, activists, and social change makers who transcend disciplinary boundaries, gifted individuals who are engaged in the pursuit of big ideas and are working on projects of potentially widespread social benefit, particularly in ways that can directly alleviate human suffering self-awareness and self-reflection. This last entry that I'll read, it's very short. It's dated the 18th of December, and this was just a couple, two and a half weeks before he died. It's not the last entry he was writing, even right up until a few days before. But I want to read this because the entry ends so wonderfully. He mentions in passing some of the disorder and confusion of the previous days of the morning, the problems caused in great part by his sickness now having begun to read serious habit on his frail condition. He'd make it through Christmas with great difficulty, difficulty before landing in the Bennington Hospital for a week at New Year's. Thankfully then returning home again in early January where he spent his last week quietly with me there by his side in the house. I was delighted when Kim Wheeler suggested singing the Abramadik from the St. Matthew Passion as a way to close the service today and this was right after I speak. Um, it was an aria from that great work that Claude loved particularly, one sung on the recordings we have of it, by countertenor Michael Chan, a singer whom Claude admired especially. You'll see the words to the aria in the program. Have mercy, Lord, on me, regard my weeping. Look at me, heart and eyes will weep to thee bitterly. 
as Kim wrote to me, it has gravitas, of course, but the music is uncannily uplifting. It is, and it's a wonderful, wonderful way to close today. But in this last entry I'll read, Though God is struggling and indeed facing death more immediately in the face than either of us saying could realize, Claude, in writing his journal, wants to get to what's really important, as always. And what to him was really important was the beauty of the day. He writes, the beauty of yesterday in question? It was the music we'd heard in the evening, the evening before, the, as he writes, the miraculous B minor mass of Bach. He writes here that he even trembled at the thought of listening to the last three parts of the mass later that evening. He singles out the beautiful final solo aria that will be sung by Michael Chance, the Anu Stay, Lamb of God who take us to wake the sins of the world, have mercy on us. With the final chorus then, Dona Nobis Pacha, grant us peace. This is the this is the entry. It's today, that is the 18th of December, a Tuesday, in the late morning, and not yesterday. Yesterday was only Monday, the first day of the week, the 17th, one May, I suppose, presume. I don't mean to sound either bitter or ironic, since really I'm not, even if I do grow impatient with the increasingly crippling effects of my mysterious affliction, whatever name one may give it. Ah, there are my glasses, and here they are now on my nose again. That helps. Writing here does too, and, my, and I must not forget that. How much, though, it's hard to say with any degree of convincing accuracy. Words do, though, writing them or reading them help a good deal in preserving at least a certain sense of sanity, and I must profit from that knowledge, too, for whatever it's worth. Parent, I've been reading a good deal in recent weeks aloud to my sweet friend evenings before dinner, and to myself mornings as I sit in my robes with the first of the day's ablutions done with, and read several things at the same time, with particular pleasure these days, the big, fat, wonderful Pleiad volume of seemingly all of the travel journals of the author of La Chartreuse de Parm, the Standard. And more recently, less randomly, from the very start, Augustine's Miraculous Confession. This time, the version rousted for the look Augustine in English. I've been deeply absorbed by its profundity and beauty, and by the beauty of the Latin, too. It's six o'clock in the evening now. I didn't want to leave this brief entry in midair, but at least say that the day has been in several ways disordered and confusing. Punctuated by a cramping stomach responding to one of the laxatives my, free, my sweet and attending friend insisted that I, early this morning, take, and that kept sending me to the bathroom to alleviate at least some of the pain and cramps were causing. The beauty of yesterday, uh, most of all in the evening, are sitting in the living room before the fire and listening to the first hour, the Kyrie and the Gloria, of that greatest of all pieces of music, Bach's great mass and therefore the greatest of all the love, the greatest of all things any man has made. We will be hearing the second hour, the last three parts this evening, a little while, and I tremble even at the thought of it, in John Gardner's beautiful performance, with the solo singer so beautifully chosen, most of all Michael Chance, singing so miraculously. Chance, of course, sings that final solo that ends the work, sings it more beautifully than I've ever heard anyone else sing it. That says all that needs to be said. I'll go make a few gestures in the other room, if there are any that need doing, and then join my sweet friend in the kitchen to go and sit in the living room then and hear the last hour of Bach's Yes, Miraculous Work. And this, was, of course, was right before Christmas. Um, and we were there by the fire in the living room. The Christmas tree was up in the corner of the room. We were listening to the B minor mass. We were settled into our white canvas officer's chairs there by the fire, Claude wrapped up in his green blanket. I was there beside him. After the music, we would have our drinks. He could still take a little Campari and soda with a little vodka, with a glass of vodka. Um, and then we'd have our dinner by the other fire in the dining room and tumble off to bed. And again and again, I think of Claude's joy in the line that ended the very first entry I read you. Everything, everywhere seems a joyous feeling to be exactly how it should be, how it must be, how it is. May the, may the Lord, whoever he in fact is, bless all that is, and fill it with the love that fills my heart. Good night, sweet one. Sweet friend.
about just over a decade after I graduated from Bennington, uh, I began coming back to Vermont to sing uh, at the Marlboro Festival. And Claude would come to every performance of mine. And I remember with such uh, pride uh, the moment I was able to introduce Rudolf Serkin to Claude Fredericks. And um, and then coming back for the several times for the New England Bach Festival, and of course Claude was at every one of those performances. Um, and while I was sort of preparing for this afternoon, uh, thinking about Claude and thinking about this most Lutheran of music. Um, and, and how to kind of uh, justify this, if that such a thing is necessary. His great love of Bach, I believe it's deeply, you know, this Lutheran, very un-Zen approach to life and death. Uh, and I remember on one of the many times I was guessing in his home, uh, he, he barely contained uh, hilarity with which he served me Pesh Cardinal, Cardinal Sin, with fresh peaches. And I had never known the God to descend to the level of a but in this case, uh, since it was multilingual, that sort of made it all right. Uh, anyway, this is for you, Claude.
Thank you. And you know, I should make it an, a brief announcement that we will be having a, um, uh, there's a big bonfire at the house tonight in the lower field below the house um, from, well, clock would turn 90 tonight at midnight, or at least tomorrow's his 90th birthday. Um, and so you're all welcome to come back to the house if you find your, I mean, many of you are planning to come, but if any of you didn't know it already, you're more than welcome to come. And if you need directions, just grab me and I'll give them to you. Uh, beginning around 7.30 or so. Thanks for everyone. Thanks everyone for coming. Back uh, behind here at the end of the uh, pavilion, just some wine and cheese.